Just a reminder, next Sunday evening, we won't be here. We'll be up at the Newtons, the baptism at the Newtons. Now, for those that are on Zoom, I'm not certain if we will be able. I'll find out if, if there's a possibility with that, but um, we'll, we'll see. But uh, maybe if you are able to come out, uh, that would be a blessing for us as well. But that'll be up at the Newtons next Sunday evening. Um, just reminded coming in this evening, I want to thank Elizabeth for uh, setting up and putting out uh, the news and information on the missionary board. Uh, Elizabeth uh, puts new material and things up there every uh, little while. And so take a look and, uh, and remember that, to pray for those that are mentioned on, on the missions board. With that, I just want to thank all those who helped set up on Sundays and sit down and the refreshments and all that. So great blessing. Should add those are picking people up. We have a number of people picking different people up that need rides on Sundays and uh, thank the Lord for that. I want to mention I uh, wanted to do notes uh, seeking to maybe give a bit of uh my knowledge of Persian. So I, I, I put my sermon notes in Persian and I gave them to Sadiq this morning and he told me they're backwards. So I have to figure out how to get it in the right direction. I'm not certain how to do that, but he, he, uh, he said, just send them to him and he will work that out. So praise the Lord. Let's open our Bibles to Romans chapter 13. <clears throat> Romans chapter 13. <clears throat> we read beginning at verse 8. Owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, are all are summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Now, you may be right in saying that this message tonight from this portion is a sequel to what we were looking at this morning in Philippians. And uh, you'll recall from last Sunday evening in our study in the previous verses in chapter 13 that the church is given instruction concerning its relationship and its responsibility with governing powers. We're shown that all governing powers are, and rulers, all in authority, they've been ordained of God. And he has placed them there for the purpose of making and enforcing laws, those that are supposed to protect uh, those who obey and to punish those who do not obey. And the word, we're charged to be law-abiding citizens, while at the same time living lives that are pleasing and obedience to the Lord. Jesus exhorted those in Israel under the yoke of Rome, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And so we move into verse 8 tonight and through verse 10, where the Christian, those of us who are under those authorities, were discipled concerning the heart and relationship that we are called into with Christ and with one another called the debt of love. Verse 8 again says, Owe no man anything but to love one another. This reaches not only to those in the body of Christ. I, I believe that is, is uh, central. It's, it is a, the main focus, but it does go to everyone, including our own neighbors. It's often in our family. But uh, again, there is this... Uh, more focus, too, on the family of God, where it is more revealing. And in fact, at times, it can be even more difficult. 
Another way it could be framed is that because Jesus, due to his great love for us, because he paid the debt that we owed, it should follow that we set aside any emotional, spiritual debt that we place upon others and put ourselves in the most loving debt, and that is loving one another. In other words, pay your dues, as it were, love one another, which is a debt that we must always be willing to pay the rest of our lives. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. Now, the terms of owing no man, we know it's not dealing with earthly loans, earthly debts. There are times when one needs to, of course, take out a loan from the bank, you know, buy a house, start a business. The owing of no man is to do with putting yourself in a position in which you place yourself under a burden, a yoke in which you do something and expect no return, such as a favor. It's not, you know, I I rub your back, you rub mine, that sort of mentality. Though I would pause here and I would, of course, remind us that even though we do often owe, uh, you know, there's credit cards and all those sorts of things. I reminded of a man who called the police and he was frantic. He said that somebody had stolen his wallet, which had all his credit cards in. And uh, instructed the police, but don't look too hard. He's charging less than my wife. You know, and that might be the case. But even when it comes to getting a mortgage for a home, it can say, you know, place a person in financial bondage. And it, sometimes these things can cause grief. But again, this passage is not actually dealing with that subject. His emphasis is upon the owing, not of money, but rather it is the owing of the love of Christ. And therefore, the debt that we are held to continuously pay back, it's not material, but it's spiritual. The debt is to love one another. Love here being the, in Greek, agape, which in the Bible is very often used not only just as a term for love, but it's a descriptive term of what love is. It best describes the love of God for us, a love demonstrated. And for us, it's been demonstrated by Christ as he gave himself. And that love demonstrated also began even before he came into the world with the love of the Father for the Son and also for his bride. And he paid the debt we owed with his own blood. He paid it with his own body on the tree. And when he did that, he didn't then have a sign a contract, or what do they call those things, prena, in the marriage between Christ and his bride as a contract to pay him back. No, it's all a debt of love. The great importance of this love that we are to have first is for God and then for one another, and is presented in the most revealing way in what has been called the love chapter. I'm not going to be saying anything about it tonight, but just listen to what's written and, and note, if you will, the height and the depths of what the love that is called upon by you and by me through Christ. And I know if you're like me, you fall short in this love. Praise the Lord. Jesus never fails in this and falls short. But listen, 1 Corinthians 13, 1 says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love envies not. Love vaunts not itself, is not puffed up. Does not behave itself unseemly. Seeks not her own, is not easily provoked. Thinks no evil. Rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. 
Whether there are prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass, darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. And now abides faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. The greatest of these is love. Back here in Romans, in verse 8, we read that he who loves another has fulfilled the law. That's why it's great. This means so much more when we also hear our Lord say this in Matthew 5, 16, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. How did Jesus fulfill the law? He did so by laying down his own life for us. That's how he fulfilled it. He loved us with an everlasting love and gave himself for us to redeem us, to reconcile us to God. That is the great demonstration of what we're called to here, to love in this great way. To love one another. To love one another. It's the fulfilling of the law. Whoever we come in contact with, and again, this goes beyond believers, but begins with Christ and is especially toward one another in Christ, we are to have that same love. The law itself does not have emotions. The law itself doesn't have any such desires as love. It is the love from Jesus Christ, the giver of the holy law of love. Now we see here that Paul, he quotes some commandments, and we know that both, uh, that they were given in both in the law of Moses, but they're also given in the law of Christ, which is the law of love. We see that in verse 9, for the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, are all summed up in the same, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You see, the purpose of Paul mentioning these commandments is not to give it just a treatise on the Ten Commandments from the Old Covenant. There are some who say that the only thing that is going to save our country and the church in Canada is to return to the Ten Commandments. That might be a means of having, you know, maybe a bit more peaceful neighborhoods at times, but that's not what saves. That's not what will save. What is the emphasis? The emphasis is on the end of verse 9, summed up in the saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Showing that this is, again, the law of love. It fulfills because... It's because you show love that you don't commit adultery. It's because you show this love, you don't murder, you don't steal, you don't bear false witness. It's not because you're a legalist. It's because you're a lover of Christ. Put this into application. Put it into action, what he's saying. When you love your neighbor as yourself, there is a way in which you not only view that person and think of that person, but it's the way you treat that person. Now, don't forget this love for neighbor. It's not the false love of Hollywood, Hollywood. When it says love as you love yourself, love your neighbor as yourself. This is not that self love or that self uh, seeking that we talked about this morning. This is a love that must be found in the new heart. See, to love yourself 
as a Christian is to love yourself in Christ. It's to love yourself as Christ loved you. It is a demonstration. The, the, the Lord says that it's the love of God that it's been spread, moved to put within us, within our hearts by the Holy Spirit. It's a love that seeks only what is good, holy, as you seek by God's grace, the love of Christ to transform you, you desire that that same love transforms others. And therefore, verse 10 says, love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Doing no harm to a neighbor doesn't stop at just physical harm. It covers every area, covers every aspect of one's neighbor. It even would include, again, thinking harm against a neighbor. Jesus said this in Matthew 5, 21. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment. See, if you're angry, if your thoughts of, of anger, and that anger is a, leads to a, a sense of of uh, desiring hurt upon them. Jesus saying, it begins there. Love doesn't just begin at the action. It begins with the thoughts. One looks upon a woman to lust, they've committed adultery in their heart. If one hates his brother, they have committed murder in their hearts. That's the principle of it. A few years back, there was a TV program was produced in the United Kingdom, and it was entitled Neighbors from Hell. And the premise of that show was to present to the world this these different neighbors that just didn't get along. And it wasn't just that they weren't friendly with each other or by, uh, by just not talking but they showed these actual videos of neighbors at war with each other. And for example, there was one man who would stand outside his neighbor's house and he would just scream and curse whenever the person living in there showed their face at their window or came out their door. Be all quiet. As soon as that neighbor saw them, they would come out there out of their door and just scream and curse. There's another one who would blast music 24 hours a day and night, and the police would be called. The police would come, and as soon as the le they left, blaring the music again. And it wasn't because they were wanting to have uh, the music for enjoyment. They were purposely putting it on to make it hard for the people that they hated next door. Well... We who are loved by Christ Jesus are called away from that. That's a sinful desire to see someone suffer, to make it difficult for others to live peacefully. We are not called to spew hatred and anger toward others in our hearts, first of all, and then with our actions, whether it be our mouths or our, our hands or our feet. Our calling is to demonstrate the love of Christ that has been demonstrated to us by Christ. Who of us deserves the love of Christ? Not one of us, but still we've received it. Therefore, we're to give it. Listen to several Proverbs and Psalms that are specifying these truths. Proverbs 10, 12, hatred stirs up strife but love covers all sins. Proverbs eleven twelve. he that is void of wisdom despises his neighbor, but a man of understanding holds his peace. And Psalm 15, 1 says, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. The tongue of the wise uses knowledge rightly, but the mouth of fools pours forth foolishness. And Proverbs 3.27 says, Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in the power of your hand to do so. Do not say to your neighbor, go and come back and tomorrow I'll give it when you have it with you. Do not devise evil against your neighbor 
for he dwells by you for safety's sake. Now, let's just come back again to that verse 10, the end of it, where it says, love is the fulfillment of the law. The more literal translation does not have the word the. It reads, love is the fulfilling of law. And that word law covers a lot of things. It covers all, you could use all the rules and instructions. And, and so that's why we come in, we see it as all the rules or all the commandments, instructions in Christ. It's the fulfillment of that which is in Christ, because only Christ could fully fulfill the law. That unlatches this love from just legalism to the law. This, this takes love further. This, again, shows that it is our being in Christ that makes this possible. That following rules and res regulations, simply to follow rules and regulations, doesn't cut it. This means that this love that we have been freely given, we then, because of Christ, we are then able to freely give it to others. It fulfills all that is from him, all that he is, all that he accepts, all his word. It's bound up in one simple but heavenly command, love one another as I have loved you. Just look at what it says in 1 John, well-known portion on this very subject. 1 John chapter 4. <clears throat> So verse 7, it says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. So anything less than this type of love expressed in our conduct, our thoughts, our actions toward others is not a demonstration of the love of Christ. The teaching of love for both friend and enemies given to us as those who have been born again, who have been made citizens of heaven, who have been united into Christ. And that those who are followers of Christ, we no longer live with the hearts and mindsets of the world, which is, again, we looked at this morning, which is self-seeking, self self uh exaltation rather we were to have the mind of christ rather than hating those who hate us for the sake of christ we love rather than responding back with hatred we we do good to them for the sake of christ rather than treating those of the world who hate us with the same hatred we seek to do them good by not only saying we love you but by putting that love into action as Jesus put his love into action as he shed his blood. And who did he shed his blood on the cross for? For us, sinners. There's a story of a Scottish soldier. His name was Angus, and he was in during World War II. And he was captured. He was put into one of the most br brutal prisoner of war camps. Um, you may have seen the movie... I'm not, you can correct me if I have this word wrong, but bridge over the river Kwai, is that how you, maybe you've seen or read the book or seen the movie, He was, where they were forced by the Japanese to build this bridge and they were working to blow it up in, uh, instead. And he was there, not in the movie, but in the, the real time of it. 
The camp that he was in, this prison camp, was filled with men from America, from Australia, from Britain, and it became a dog-eat-dog kind of condition, a battle of survival. And along with the horrible treatment by the, the prison guards, the prison camp, prisoners often turned against prisoners. They turned on each other. They would steal from each other. Uh, the only way that they could keep anything that they had, what little they had, was to just sleep with it and hold on to it. But still, even at that, there would be those who were able to find a way to steal it from under their noses. But survival, self-preservation was everything. The law of the jungle prevailed there. But one day that began to change. You see, the news of the death of the Scottish soldier, Angus, spread through the camp like wildfire. Now, there had been many others who had died. But there was something different. No one could believe Angus had succumbed to death. He, they, they viewed him as a strong one. He, he was one of those that they expected to make it through. Well, it's not the fact of his death that brought about change. It was what led to his dying. You see, there, there's an English slang word, mucker, and that was actually a derogatory remark when it was first being used. It was used for those considered low, those who were considered kind of the scum of the earth, dirty, people you didn't want to hang around with, uh, not associated with. But, uh, but after the war, there was the wars in India, it became a term for the soldiers as a term for brotherhood a friendship that couldn't be broken. They had fought in the muck and mire together. And so they called their buddy their mucker. And they took this seriously, very seriously. Well, Angus's mucker was dying. And everyone had given up on him. Everyone, of course, but Angus. He had made up his mind that his mucker, his buddy, his fellow in the muck would not die. Someone had stolen his mucker's blanket. So Angus gave him his own, telling his mucker that he had just come across an extra one. Every mealtime, Angus would get his rations and take it to his friend, stand over him and force him to eat it, telling him, I'll find food later. See, Angus did everything and anything he could to see that his mucker would survive. But as Angus's mucker began to recover, Angus himself began to lose. And he collapsed. He slumped over. And he died. Angus, he died of exhaustion. He died of starvation. Everyone learned that Angus had given his own food, and shelter. He had given everything he had, even up to his very own life. Now, what's more and most important is this. The ramifications of his acts of love and unselfishness had a startling impact on the compound, for he was a follower of Christ. As word circulated, of his sacrificial death, the atmosphere of the camp began to change. Suddenly, they began to focus on their muckers and their mates, their friends, and they began to think of the fact that we're not here just to survive. We are here together. And many of these hardened soldiers, because of that witness for Christ, they were brought under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, and they put their faith in Christ. And there were some who began to tool their talents or pool their talents. One was a violin maker. Another was an orchestra leader. Another was a cabinet maker, another professor. And all these who came from these different backgrounds, they organized themselves into an orchestra full of these homemade instruments, and they gathered, calling themselves the church without walls. I mean, they had walls all around them, but they were the church without walls. And this was so powerful and so compelling that even some of the Japanese guards began to attend. And the men began uh, even some sorts of, in what they were able to use, 
uh, they began to put together their own hospital. They put together a library. They, they started an education system within the camp. The place was transformed. Stealing and other crimes became almost non-existent. And it was not just because they turned over a new leaf, but they had new hearts. And the love of another covered a multitude of sins. That was the difference. The love of Christ transformed. Transformed muckers. Those who were covered in the dirt of the, the prison camp and the war they were in. We're now brothers in Christ. We know not everyone became born again believer in that camp, but it sure changed it. You don't see it in the movie, but you read of it in the testimonies of some who came out. The love of God is so costly that the son of God gave everything. He died for his enemies who he would make into his friends. The selfless attitude of Christ lived out in the life of the believer and the church. It, 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 it comes and it's, it roots out that self-seeking attitude and gives to us a selfless attitude, that of Christ. The love of Christ lived out in our lives will lead us not only to treat our neighbors and friends in a right way, but also lead us to Share the, the love of Christ with others. Yes, this love, it's a costly love. It's sacrificial. But how about you? Do you share the love of Christ? Do you take him with you and show and, and, and tell friend and foe of his amazing love? Do you demonstrate it? Oh, may the Lord enable us who have received his most amazing grace spread his most amazing love. May we spread it to others, share it with others in our homes, our neighborhoods, in our church family, both here and when we're in our own homes, because this is the most amazing, most powerful, most life changing, transforming love. And if you're going to have a debt, this is the debt to owe, the loving debt we owe. Somebody wrote, come, let us tell of a wonderful love, tender and true, out of the heart of the Father above, streaming to me and to you. Jesus, the Savior, this gospel to tell, joyfully came, came with the helpless and hopeless to dwell, sharing their sorrow and shame. Seeking the lost, saving, redeeming at measureless cost. Come to my heart, O oh, thou wonderful love. Come and abide, lifting my life till it rises above envy and falsehood and pride. Seeking to be, seeking to be, lowly and humble, a lover for thee. Let's sing together a song that speaks of this love. It's a love that comes from Christ. It's the love of God. 67. <laughs> 